He can see us. We can't see ourselves. Oh, that's good. Hello, everybody, and welcome to, I think, the sixth talk from the Architects Bookshop um, Isolation Talks. Uh, tonight we have Dan and Gillam, Lee and Ashley from their studio in downtown Botany. Um, so I'll just bring the, the guys up on, or the guys and girls up on screen. How are you two tonight? Yeah, good. Thanks, yep, Adam. Good. good. <laughs> Enjoying isolation in Botany, I see. Well, yeah. So life's not actually so different for us yeah. because we, you know, as you know, live and work from home already, so um, the studio's at the back. We've got a few, we actually added a few slides about that in the talk because we thought, well, it's kind of topical at the moment, living and working at home. Yeah, you, you, yours was the easiest transition to move out of your office, move into your house ever. Yeah, well, no, we didn't. We just tucked everyone else out. <laughs> <laughs> we sent everyone else home and we stayed. Oh, um, I thought tonight we'd just talk a little bit before we start while... Um, Lee and Ashley get their slides ready. I thought we'd talk a little bit about what's happening globally. We haven't spoken much about the COVID crisis and uh, how people are dealing with it, but I know we've got a lot of people watching from um, Europe. We've got people from Spain. Um, I had an email from Switzerland. Uh, we've had people from the United States um, touch base with us and tell us that they were watching so uh, to everyone out there who's not from Sydney or Australia uh, we hope you're doing well wherever you are we hope you're dealing with the crisis as best as you can uh, we've probably sidestepped most of the health crisis that we can in Australia we're all just dealing with the um, economic and uh, physical isolation which is the reason for doing this to try and keep everybody focused on the fact that we're all here that we're all here to support each other and that in the end, it's a great opportunity to talk about uh, great architecture, which is what brings us to tonight's talk. Um, Lee and Ashley have run a practice, uh, Dunn and, Dun and Hillam, and I met Lee and Ashley a couple of years ago, uh, work when I think when Lee was working for the Government Architects Office. And what I really like about the work they do is that they, um, they look at small moves to make big uh, impacts and their work exists beyond the, the boundaries of metropolitan Sydney. Uh, they work mostly, well not mostly, but they often work in rural areas on very small civic buildings or very uh, small urban design master plans and I think the thing that I'm excited about that is that that kind of commitment to uh, the small moves that really do help um, create a difference for uh, the communities that they work in. So without further ado, uh, I'll move across and um, uh, Ashley and Lee can take over. Over to you guys. Okay, thanks. And yeah, thanks. Um, hi to everyone else who's sitting at home. I found these talks really good. I've been enjoying watching them. I think, um, you know, I, I actually have attended more um, architects talks than I ever have because I don't have to leave home to do it. So um, it's been really... <laughs> It's been really good. One of the things I was thinking about, um, I think Adam and you and I were talking earlier on about, you know, soldiering on through this, and we, we've been really lucky. You know, we already work from home. Uh, if you can see in this slide, this is our studio and, and the doors, the garage doors are open there, and you can see out into our garden and our house. That's our house in the background. Um, so we've been doing we've been doing good, but that doesn't stop you feeling kind of anxious about what's going on everywhere else and around the world. And um, so you feel sometimes a little bit brain fuzzy because of all of this uncertainty. And I just wanted to read you something that Don Watson read uh, wrote in the monthly this month, which says, "We tread in such uncertainty and in such an altered landscape, we dare not think too many thoughts." And I think that just sort of sums it up for me at the moment is that I can't seem to think too many thoughts. So that's by way of apologising if this is all a bit fractured and jumps around. <laughs> um, so I thought we would start by showing you um, our house and our studio, which you're looking at there and some of our team in the background there. Um, oh, why can't I change slides? Oh, did I just do that? So this is um, one of Cat Lou's great photographs of our house and I uh, like it a lot because it sort of shows the whole inside outside thing and the outdoor bath and the veggie garden and the whole um, 
blurred boundaries there between our house and our garden and then further off to the if you zoomed around to the um, right of that slide you'd see the studio again so um, this is what it looks like from the street we're on a corner so all our staff come in this little hooded uh, leverance door here and um, they they um, oh I don't know can you see my cursor can they see my cursor Adam I don't know anyway um, you can we see can, it's kind of, can see yeah, you can. Yeah, okay. Right. Um, it's almost like a little uh, type study because we've got the weatherboard house at the front, which is the original building that was there, and then the brick studio at the back with the north and east facing um, Dampelon wall and the garage doors. And then this is an addition we did on the back, a little two story kind of um, almost like a uh, stables building that we smashed up against the back of the weatherboard and has our kids' bedrooms and balcony up the top there. Um, so, and it's in an industrial area, so it's a little bit kind of everything goes. Uh, like um, most architects, we use our own place to experiment on, so. All, all done at different times over the last 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, we haven't kept to any sort of strong theme there. We just do what we feel like at the time. Uh, this is a diagram that um, Grace, who used to work for us, did, which we always find very amusing, which was about how the live work thing works really in reality, and it's a big tangled up mess. Um, the yellow is um, what we call the shed people, which is all our staff. And it's what That came from what our kids used to call them when, um, when they were very little, call all the people who worked in the shed, the shed people. And then, uh, you know, us coming and going from the house. And, of course, there's the dog that does whatever the hell he likes. Um, this is something that we did for a talk ages ago, but I think I keep coming back to it because it's our kind of stance on how we think about sustainability as being this really multi-pronged, um, multi-layered thing. Uh, it's just really about um, – I'm not going to go into that. You can see that. Can we do less? What have we already got? Do we want heat in or out? How are we going to plan for a future that we don't know? And that's topical. Um, you know, what's the point of putting something really high tech in or something that's like an origami house that needs to be open and closed seven times a day if no one knows how to drive it? And um, ultimately, it's the human beings in there that are the most important. I think what's you want to go back? No, we don't have to go back. Oh, We've gone the wrong way. Oh, I'm going the wrong way again. <laughs> um, I think what was important about that is that we actually spend a lot of our time at the beginning of jobs with new clients trying to talk them out of building anything. Yeah. Um, which is sometimes counterintuitive to running a successful practice, but yeah. um, means that we actually get to the crux of what the issues are with the client very quickly. Um, so we've set up, we've just we just decided to show a few projects that we haven't talked about much at all and also um, show projects that aren't yet built or may never get built or um, really aren't the kind of things that architects all that often get themselves involved in, uh, the first one being one of those. And um, I've kind of categorised them into five sections, which is places we'd rather be. I think we've all got places we'd rather be at the moment. Um, shit houses, because that's the uh, the theme of um, small scale public architecture in Australia at the moment is that you get to do very fancy toilet blocks. Um, nothing to see here, which is another theme of, um, of our work is that we feel like we've had a big success if um, if you get to the one of our built projects and you can't really see what's been done, then we'll feel very chuffed. Um, unusual briefs, which is just some quirky things, and then what we're working on right now. So I'm going to start. We're just going to go back and forwards between us, um, depending on who knows more about the project. Um, we're going to start with this this one, and Ashley's going to talk about it. So the Booberoy Woolshed, um, it's about an hour out of Condoblin, um, in Western New South Wales. This is a project that we did with Heritage New South Wales, which is um, the first part of a hopefully a multi-staged uh, proposal where we won a tender to go and study and come up with a maintenance schedule for a, a, a huge 64 stand shearing shed um, built in around 1900 out of 
out of um, cypress pine or locally forested. So, can again? yeah, can you click forward? This is um, this is the the uh, the front shed a little bit um, after they built it, probably about ten years after they built it. This this shed was shearing upwards of two hundred and fifty thousand sheep a year in its heyday, and had had a siding diverted, a rail siding diverted from the main train line that runs over to, to Western Australia. Oh, I'm terrible. Yep. Um, this is the inside of the shearing shed that, um, as we found it, um, a lot of the uh, original shearing gear that's still in there and what you can see there replaced the original steam gear, which was actually under the shed when we went and and looked under there when we were, were when we were surveying it. So ostensibly, this project for us at this stage was to come in, have a look. Um, it's really on its last legs. This shed. It's stood for you know 150 odd years or 100 years, and um, it's it hasn't been used as a shearing shed for the last 15 to 20 years, which means that it hasn't been maintained. And so it's falling over, and this is a really important part of Australia's um, cultural and rural heritage. This one that you're looking here, I'm going to ask some dumb questions, people, because I didn't get to work on this one very much. But this one here, that's that's kind of gappy for a reason, isn't it? Isn't this sort of partly sun shading, partly letting the air in, or? Yeah, it's partly. It's also partly age and missing teeth. So right. it, it's um, <laughs> it's shrunk, shrunk cypress pine weatherboards. It's the only original part of the elevation. The structure is mostly original, but the um, that's the only original part of the elevation left. So what, one of the interesting things about this building is it was an enormous shed, which is the this area on the right here. Um, they quite soon afterwards realised that with such large numbers of sheep, they built a, what's called a sweating shed, which is a place for sheep to keep dry if it's raining um, before they shear them and then built a covered race to join the two things. It's quite an uncommon um, arrangement and built on, on strange axis. So never really got to the bottom of what it was like. That. Before they realised it didn't rain. Yeah, <laughs> well, it did rain maybe then, who knows? Maybe it did rain. Um, the, the process was to go in, we spent um, three or four days on site, crawling around the building and measuring and then coming up with a set of drawings to understand um, and, and kind of unpack the story of how this thing was constructed. Where did you get the sheep symbols? Um, we drew them. <laughs> you know, um, Vectorworks doesn't provide a sheep symbol. Um, the drawings are then, um, we had to basically come up with diagrams within the drawings to be able to identify areas and then prioritise the work that needed to happen. Now, all of this work was happening because uh, the owners, it's a privately owned shed on a private property um, want to repurpose it because they um, th they no longer sheep farmers they run cattle now um, and we the job was to get this building to stay up for another hundred years and then after that to help them develop an idea of how it might be repurposed um, we might we should flick through we've got quite a lot haven't we um, the, the the report that came with it at the end um, basically graded all of the different areas of the building and then gave it a high, medium and low priority as to when it needed to um, be fixed and, and, and how. And then identifying the key areas that we needed to fix, which is water ingress, killing footings, um, wind damage from, from storms, ripping roof sheets off um, and general neglect, basically. The next stage, which hopefully we can show you in the next talk, is what we're proposing to do with it. But we haven't agreed that one yet, so we can't really show it. <laughs> you haven't agreed that amongst yourself or with the client? Both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's enough wedding venues in this part of the world. We don't need another wedding venue. So we're actually trying to think about how it can fit into a much broader regional, rural uh, museum context. And so we're talking to different museums about how buildings like this can become part of their inventory, even if, though they're remote from the main museum building, and how you can keep both academic and uh, tourism interest within buildings like that as a teaching um, resource to take people there to teach them. We've already run a, a, a heritage conservation course out there with the, the master's program run at Sydney Uni, and that was a bit of a, a trial run of putting 
putting students up there and, and using the building to teach. And then we're going to look at other ways in which that can happen. And the development is potentially uh, looking at the shearers' quarters, which are adjacent to the hut, to the shearing shed, to, to provide accommodation and, and carry that on. And have they started any of the, uh, the rectification works to maintain the building and stop it falling down yet? Yeah, the, all the high priority works have happened. Um, it's it's actually, um, don't have long enough to talk about it really, but the procurement for skilled labour out in areas like this is really tricky. So we were combining a, 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 the skills and knowledge of a, of a very brilliant heritage builder in Sydney that we work with a lot. And then being able to develop TAFE courses for, for locals in the region to learn how to um, basically work on and fix uh, old timber rude buildings. Okay, Telegraph Station. Oh, more. Okay. So Telegraph Station um, was part of a, a much bigger series of projects that we worked on up in the Northern Territory a few years ago. Um, anyone that knows Alice Springs probably knows the Telegraph Station. It's, it was the beginning of um, the European settlement of Alice Springs. It's what connected it to the rest of the country. Um, it's actually built on a very prominent traditional site, um, which was extremely problematic then and, and remains so now. However, it's a favourite place for locals um, to, to picnic and go and hang out. It's one of the only green spaces um, at, that's publicly accessible um, in, in the area. We originally were commissioned to look at um, providing additional toilets and through trying to talk them out of doing those toilets, we managed to talk them into looking at a much broader view on developing a master plan to look at how the Telegraph Centre could be more than just a historical location. Um, th these are some quick, these are drawings that we did of a, of a proposed toilet block for them, which we then persuaded them not to build. I can probably skip through the drawings. Yeah, we can. Um, the context of it is that the building that you can see on the left of the top drawing um, was the existing stables for the telegraph station. And so we started looking at how we might be able to use that form and scale and, and the, the adobe construction and dry stone wall and, construction. And tuck this in behind it so yeah. you wouldn't be able to see it from any of the heritage parts of the precinct so yeah and um, also oh, the from track. yeah the model shows that so um we keep skipping on there um this got all the way through to documentation before we won the argument over saying it was not appropriate <laughs> <laughs> um so this was a this was part of the argument um where we said it was really important that we pegged out um, the proposed building on the site and looked at it from not just from where the buses arrive for all the tourists, but we looked at it from the prominent and important um, elements of the landscape, which were identified by the traditional owners that we were talking to. This one's probably the most important one, which is, I, I can't remember, I'm afraid, the, um, the Aboriginal name for this hill, but it's known as Trig Hill. Um, and so we were looking at how views back towards Alice Springs and also the Telegraph Station would be impacted by mocking up the, the roof form. You can see there in the, the orange lines. Yeah, with our pink We're pink ribbon. Doing a one-to-one -one mock up. Yeah. What it led to was the development of a brief for uh, a visitor's centre that dealt with the whole area, not just the Telegraph Station. Um, the idea for this was that it could it could handle the museum section of the Telegraph Station, but it could also deal with events. Um, it could provide a, a much needed cafe restaurant for the town that was close to town and but also within the landscape and became a, a hub for things like mountain biking, walking, trekking um, and, and the, the cultural history of, of the place. This um, got taken on board and and this was what we proposed here again was a rammed earth a, a thermally massive rammed earth construction with a with a double floating light roof over the top of it um, this was taken on board by national parks and is sitting patiently in a queue to try and find funding from the chief minister so if we've got anyone from the northern territory watching we can uh, try and make some noise about this it'd be a lovely project to get going again I think that's one of the vagaries of working in um, in 
government projects is that you you get caught up in the election cycle sometimes and um, projects that look like a good idea for everybody get shelved because they were um, you know the the idea of the previous um, governing party so um, that's that's something that we we've learned over the years that you just wait until that party gets back into power and then you you bring it back to life the building was designed as a as a passively controlled environment um, with no mechanical um, uh, infrastructure needed to keep it occupiable and habitable through the summer months. Okay. Now, the obligatory shit houses. This one, I'm not going to talk about, but I think, um, you know, it's brick. And it wasn't, <laughs> you know, talking about brick shit houses was, um, it, it, it did come up quite a lot when we were doing this. So on some levels of what we've just talked about, we completely failed on this job because we <laughs> usually try and talk them into building something smaller. Oh, yeah, no, this one. But this one went from a <laughs> from two toilets to something bigger than Ben-Hur. So after we won the commission for this, the local council funded a <clears> water <throat> park, which you can just see on the left-hand side within the, within the park in Camden where this is built. And the brief then became something that needed to provide changing spaces for the users of that park and then interestingly and also I think very importantly they wanted to have a an accessible changing room that's on a, a national list um, which has lifting hoists and uh, it's a really specialized um, public facility for people in usually in motorized chairs with carers to allow them to access things like water parks and but also because they had a very a, a very young female mayor who had at least one small child, perhaps two small children, who went everywhere, all her meetings and everything. She came with these kids and prams and things, and she wanted to. Um, so she she put it in that we'd um, all the, all the toilets had to be able to fit a mum and two kids and multiple prams. So there, there's no standard toilet cubicles in this, I don't think. So the, the principle behind this was to take something that ended up being quite big, but to try and break it down into smaller pieces. So there was always sight lines. So a safety and design issue, but also a scale issue within a within a very lovely local and heavily used local park. Um, there's a few interesting issues around this type of work, which I'm sure people, other people working in this area understand. And that is that you um, often lose control once you've documented the building and that was very much the case in this project for us that was out of our hands when it got built but actually still hurting yes <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of detail in there that never made it through and got changed in the process but the main moves remain it's I, I mean again I didn't have much to do with it so I'm allowed to say this but I love the all the different brickworks here and how kind of sort of soft it ended up looking despite its solidity yeah so. good lazy concrete oh uh, shush <laughs> um <laughs> uh, we... a plan just describing very quickly the, the over on the right hand side is the changing places changing room with wheelchair storage out outside of it and then um yeah just a series of drawings um okay so this is one of these tiny little moves jobs this is mother hall this is how it um was when you found it and actually how it still is in that the ex they didn't have enough money to um painting the outside but they did have a series i think three or four tiny little grants that were allowing them to do um certain things inside and through having all these tiny little grants they realized that um they really needed to have a plan so that they they obviously were quite good at and successful in getting grants, but they um, needed to know where they were heading with all of these, you know, some, some grants were for just like $5,000 or so they needed to have a list of what they were going ahead with. The big project they've just completed is that this floor, even though it looks quite um, sweet in this photo, was actually like the rolling ocean and um, dipped away in this bottom corner so severely that they didn't feel like they could let anyone in there. Um, so that floor has now been replaced. Um, it's a great little hall. They were very, they were equally um, attached to things like the honour boards as they were to this kind of graffiti that's in all the, there's two little dressing rooms or green rooms at the back of the hall and, you know, they, they love this and they're very keen on making sure it all gets kept. These are the um, existing and still existing um, toilets for the hall, which I thought 
some people would find entertaining. Um, and this is the space between the hall and the local RFS shed, the local uh, rural fire service. So this is where the volunteers park their fire trucks um, in between going to fire, push fires, which as you all know happens far too often, but mostly in summer. Um, and as you can see, this area between was just this sort of, you know, anyone can drive their car anywhere. And so you'd have something quite nice going on in the hall, but this hall will get full up with cars parked higgledy piggledy. So our plan really was to give them some new toilets and to reclaim this area as a kind of a community uh, courtyard or, or public green in between. So bollards, this was our big move here, <laughs> bollards, and then to, to contain that at the front, we had to allow that the fire truck could still come through and fill up the water tank here when that was on. We were just hoping there wasn't a wedding and a bushfire going on at the same time. Um, and then uh, a small toilet block with the with a kind of a privacy wall to the front and then a, a kind of a barbecue place and sink um, facing out into this courtyard and um, dimensions here showing the size of the marquee that they'd be allowed, that they'd be able to put up. Um, I think they imagined that this marquee might be where you sat for dinner in the, if you were having your wedding there and that the main hall stayed as kind of a dance a dance floor, and then they've got the kitchen out the back. So that's just um, like you were saying, Adam, one of these little projects where it's, um, I think we, we're just making some tiny little moves to um, to basically create this area of um, of nothing in the middle, but that's the most important thing we could do there, we feel. Um, okay, so this is nothing to see here. So again, we hope, um, that I, I sp with Sydney Dance, it was it was for different reasons that we normally do it. Like we, but with Sydney Dance, it was really part of um, the brief, wasn't it? That it had to be a performance space that um, was a background, not a foreground. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a backdrop, wasn't it, for the dancers? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, that's really unreadable, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> so this was a this was a really interesting project that had to happen very quickly um, as. Sydney Dance were re had uh, were relocated as a result of the um, the, the larger project happening um, in in redoing the Sydney Theatre and Sydney Dance area down on the wharves. Um, Sydney Dance needed a rehearsal studio uh, for their professional troupe and their pre-professional student dancers. Um, the, the beginning of this job was us working with Create New South Wales and Sydney Dance and identifying potential sites. So we actually looked at three or four different sites around Sydney and ended up choosing this one in Ultimo, mainly uh, because of its location and the fact that it could be, it's walkable from a lot of places, uh, but also because the, the building itself lent, lent itself to, to the program that we wanted to put in it. Um, Really, the, the complexity in this job was to allow the existing um, kind of early 20th century industrial building to still remain in a, and provide a highly serviced space, but without it looking like anyone tried too hard. So we could provide a backdrop for the, for the work that they do in there and, and the dances. This all had to happen in about a, I think we had six months to design, get it approved and document, and then we had uh, nine months to build it and it was done on time and on budget miraculously. This was completed uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago. I think it's actually it's heartbreaking um, but the owner that it was a short-term lease that was taken out by the government um, and I don't know what happened in the negotiation of this lease but because they didn't um, negotiate an option to, to renew the owner of the building has now put in a request to demolish this building to put student accommodation up above. Maybe that's gone on hold now. Yeah, this might be one of the positives um, of the uh, current situation. But, um, there was a really good article written in the conversation um, a few months ago about how this is a a public service. Sydney Dance Offer, there's about 75,000 public visits a year to the dance studios for private dance classes for the, that are publicly accessible. Um, and this is a really heavily used space and has been extremely popular. And one of the people that um, attends these dance classes also happens to be Professor of Architecture at UTS. 
<laughs> and wrote an article on how she thought maybe not the building could remain, but the program could remain within the building that gets that replaces it. That having a dance studio in this area and a, a cultural space in that area was really important and it needed to stay. I think this is a, one of the, it, it's such a funny building because they, they're such great photographs with these dancers in there, but they really um, uh, show how, how, um, how backgrounded the architecture is, which is success. And then, yes. you know, quirky rear lane elevations that we all get excited by. It's the levering celebration. And <laughs> <laughs> um, this one we kind of decided not to talk about too much, but um, just uh, thought we'd show you uh, two photos of it. So this is an old house in Camden that the council owned. It was there, was actually the mayoral, mayoral offices and they got a uh, donation of a collection of paintings that came with um, an obligation to exhibit these paintings permanently and so they decided to convert this old uh, doctor's house um, and schoolhouse that had a, it's had a few um, lives uh, into an art gallery and so this is in Camden if you're out there check it out um, lots of um, fun and games with different oils on finishes and doing um, nice patches and uh, working with what was existing without being um, uh, while being respectful but also being um, you know allowing today to to come into it where necessary yep. did you want to say anything about no, that no, I, wasn't, no, I, mean, I wasn't I could, actually really yeah. planning on talking about that one that's not your job but <laughs> <laughs> um Okay, so now we, we do get asked sometimes to do funny things, um, which we love, love, love. And this one, um, we were asked by, um, it was a combination of uh, two curators, you know, Glenn Barkley and Holly Williams, who um, had to put a proposal to Lend Lease about um, some public art. And they paired us up with uh, a Melbourne artist called John Campbell, who, um, who, is, is this is some of his work that he does. He plays around a lot with um, with lettering and kind of distorting things and, and also um, kind of uh, lyrics out of songs and um, things. So he at the time was going, was putting these flags all up around the place that just said, yeah, um, and that was where we started with him with this just this idea that we would do something, um, some public art down at Barangaroo that was around this idea of saying, yeah. Um, so John provided us with these, uh, like it's his idea and we're trying to make it sort of into a, an architectural or sculptural proposal. So um, it was about shade and seating because it's a kind of a, you know, big popular lunchtime shot spot. This is the hoarding that was um, uh, containing the existing, the current building site at that time. So um, it's, it's, what this is was the eventual proposal and it, it didn't go ahead, but you can see how there's sort of yeah happens three times. It's the it's the shade with the, the distorted letters up in the air like this. It's also the seat, um, and then it's the the kind of the roving uh, scrolling around the ground shadow that um, that moves around and that's uh, I mean we we had a great time doing this, but I think the thing that I like a lot about it is that it, it seemed to be very true to what John um, what John does in his art generally is uh, make these things kind of almost almost illegible but not quite. You just have to stand still and look a little bit longer and then you see um, what it is. And just this whole, you know, positive vibes, man. <laughs> was what was really, really interesting about this, though, is that most people would have seen if this had happened and, and it's what we've all done lots of projects that never happen. And I think this is one of three projects that we've done in our 20 years of practice. That I'm really sad we never got to build because this this was a the idea of this was that most of the time it would have been seen by people out of tall win, out of windows in tall buildings. Um, and but then used by people coming out of those tall buildings um, to go and sit and maybe spend a lunchtime there. So to be able to think about it um, really sculpturally um, and sitting in space was a really interesting uh, this one, which was one of the, the early 
versions of the 3D, but just shows more about how the seats kind of were working in the So they were proposed space. to be granite granite seats with folded steel structure letters powder coated um, and it was about making them as thin as possible um, and without them moving too much so <laughs> <laughs> we started engineering but then we didn't get the funding to carry on yeah, so we didn't get it's gonna carry. hum like crazy <laughs> would have been would have been saying, it would, yeah yeah it would resonate um Okay, so this is something that we're working on at the moment, although one of the uh, slight casualties of the current um, environment because uh, it's done in collaboration with some tourism operators who are all um, just licking their wounds a little bit at the moment. It will go ahead. It's all funded. but um, And, of course, lots of talk about koalas, especially when the bushfires were going on. The council, the local council, this is a council-led project again. This is some photos of the site. Um, the council have owned it a long time and it's been used as a quarry for their road making, for their local road making, but it also has been used um, by all the locals as just a dumping ground. So there's um, car bodies over here. We've got a pile of tyres that, you know, that's quite an epic pile there. And, um, and so the opportunity, I suppose, is to make something good, a koala hospital and a wildlife sanctuary, but also uh, to use a fairly big chunk of the, the funding, let's be honest, uh, to clean the, to clean the site up. So um, when the client, when the council sh showed us the site, we were they were a little bit nervous. They thought we wouldn't want to have anything to do with it because it was so um, denuded and so kind of messed up. But it actually uh, we we were pretty excited about that. That um, and and uh, I suppose it, it works because a lot of the ways that we work are to look at where the problems are and then insert whatever we're doing into into that problematic area to to try and solve the problem. So we don't run away from the um, the kind of crappy parts of any building or the crappy parts of the site. We're actually looking for those crappy bits um, in order to put our work in it. And we started out with some really um, sort of uh, elementary mapping, which took me back to um, <laughs> to uni. I used to love these kind of mapping exercises. This um, this one here is looking at areas that had all been cleared in the past. Uh, this one was looking at kind of a zone that was all along a similar um, topographical line. And these ones are about noise. So we've got a highway, we've got a go-kart track and a motorcycle speedway that are adjacent to the site um, and so we're just talking about the impact of noise in those. Um, so we, we overlay all these maps. And these ones are to do with bushfire and biodiversity. So um, this is different vegetation types for uh, the bushfire assessment. This greenish blue is all the what's called forest. The green pale green is grassland. Um, they have different rankings of um, threat under bushfire planning. So we have to work with those and, and keep our distance. This is uh, similarly um, biodiversity and where um, areas of high value are in biodiversity. So the pale green is all reasonably high um, value. And then the, um, the other, oh, I'm sorry, I've done this the wrong way around. Just ignore what I just said. This is your biodiversity because there's uh, the four zones. This is very high value up here, and this is your bushfire, so forest and grassland. So what we look at is we overlap the two of them and try and find spaces in the site where, where we can actually build. Um, I don't know how many of you have worked with biodiversity before, but there's a price per um, hectare or per tree of clearing, um, I think starting at about $80,000 a hectare. So you're working with a community project that's on a pretty tight budget. You um, you know, obviously you don't want to do any clearing anyway when you're trying to build a koala sanctuary, but you really, really don't want to do any clearing because you've got to stay away. You've got to keep within your budget. So this is the um, master plan, which just really looked at where we could place things um, away from the bushfire threat and with views out across the district. And um, so we, we went with most of the buildings kind of forming uh, like almost like a homesteady um planning format where they all circle around, you know, circle the wagons around the clearing. And um, I've just got some more in-depth drawings here. So there's a main building, which is where you'll come as a visitor and there'll be a cafe and there'll be a, a gift shop. But then there's the koala hospital. So 
they, they're actually quite different in a program and what you need. So we need to um, we need to we need the koala hospital to be prominent, but we don't want the uh, school excursion rocking up over there. So it's it was tricky. It's tricky like that. And then you can just see here a plan of the main building, which is um, in uh, just its main concept. It is a massive agricultural shed, and we are building in and under that shed. The, the internal area in this shed will end up being about a quarter of the floor space of the area under the roof, um, and the rest of it will be <coughs> gauzed in. So this um, just quick little uh, Photoshop montage here shows that that end under this big roof will actually become part of the koala sanctuary where um, some of the captive koalas will live. What you learn doing these kind of projects is when they say captive koalas, what they mean is koalas that have been brought in for to be um, looked after and can't go back out because they aren't able to fend for themselves, so they stay in there. Um, and you can see the view out and we're going to build a, a billabong up there as well. Um, now, again in Gunnedah, this this is a project we were doing in Gunnedah when we got asked to do the koala sanctuary. So this was the main reason we were in town. Um, this is a cultural precinct in the site is here and it's a, a collection of um, the, the town hall, uh, the music conservatorium, the cinema and the art gallery and then a funny little community hall called the Smithhurst Theatre which actually performs its main service is to be the green rooms for all the other buildings because they were never built with any kind of back of house. Um, and you can see it's on the main street of Gunnada. Gunnada is a great um, town. It's quite lively and um, thriving because it has a combination of mining and farming. So it was one of the first towns um, to be modernised for the, for the Queen's visit in the 50s. And they're, they're, the way that they modernised this town was to remove all of the fantastic verandas up and down the main high street. Yeah. Um, which we're now busily trying to persuade them to put back. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the site from the from the edge of this pink building and the town hall. There's the, the little Smithers Theatre there and a vacant block. So that's the site on the main street. Um, you can just see a little bit of the kind of town analysis stuff that we were talking to. So we did a lot of community consultation. We were engaged to talk to the town townspeople and to work with an advisory committee of about 10 or 12 people, local people, really took the tack of getting um, all the voices, uh, dissenting and otherwise, all in the same room early, and it was our job to try and um, communicate with them. So we did, with Donna Callahan, um, went up there and a lot of this is just a, a, a few different buildings. They again, they it's a little bit like our house. They didn't shy away from um, trying a new style every time they um, built a new bit on this site. So part of what we were doing with um, you know, trying to bring this uh, really disparate bunch of people along to some kind of consensus is that we showed them lots of little models like this, um, so that we could really. Um, try and give them the impression, I suppose, that they were being part of the process and and making making the decisions alongside us. So it wasn't giving them the impression they were part of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, you did have your favourite child. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could see which was the best solution, I suppose, before they could. But you still had to listen to what um, it was important and interesting, in fact, to listen to what they all said. We thought they were going to say that this Smithhurst Theatre had to stay, absolutely had to stay, had to stay. And as soon as we started showing them alternatives where it wasn't there anymore, they were like, oh, it has to go, it has to go. Um, and this was just the, so this uh, project again is at the stage where they're just about ready to hit go on putting it into a DA. And um, what we did is try and join the, uh, the streetscape, kind of restore the streetscape um, by putting a two-storey building um, across the street edge, but I'm going to have to go backwards and forwards with this, sorry. Um, but cutting this big hole through and, you know, having a lot of fun with picking up like, the arches and things out of this building. Again, they had the, um, they felt no need to stick with any one proportion or size of arch. They just built as they felt like at that time. So we've cut this um, massive um, portal through the building there and, and mimics it with the arch window above. And um, now I'm going to see if I'm going back. 
and created a a courtyard in the centre that really becomes a kind of an outdoor community um, town square. Um, we showed them lots of photos of Seville and places like that. Um, Cordoba. That was Cordoba. the one that really won everyone over. Yeah. <laughs> Outside the, the um, mosque. And this is a new library building that kind of um, encloses that that courtyard. And this is the uh, the foyer and the bar for all of the other functions of the of the um, precinct. So uh, again, it's a little bit like um, creating a big open um, unprogrammed space in the middle that is the the key to how all the other ones um, work and so function. Library down there. Yeah, library down this uh, this northern side and um, really uh, just a lot of services and um, and other bits and pieces that the precinct really needed and, and importantly, restoring the veranda. They kept the original veranda posts. Oh, yeah. And they knocked them down from the 50s. Somebody's they, got them in his shed. Yeah, and another person has the original lace work in their shed. So, yeah. so we're tracing all of this. We're tracing it all back and hopefully yeah. we're using them. So that's, um, yeah, the... Uh, Nighttime model. Okay, and then this is the, the last project. We're going in close time. Yep. Um, in Cobar. Yeah. So Cobar. Um, I don't. Again, Cobar. I don't know how many people have been out there. It's a pretty extraordinary place. It's right where, if you look at a map of New South Wales, it's where it turns red. Um, it's literally just past. It's about two millimeters past the line of where it turns red. Um, it's Cobar. Um, European history is based entirely around copper mining and now also gold. Um, the project that we were involved in, we got asked to come and have a look at this building, which is the Great Cobar Heritage Centre. Great Cobar is the name of the original mine that was built on this area, and we can see the remnants of that mine. The mine was built in 1900 and dismantled in 1918 when the bum fell out of the copper price, out of the copper market after the First World War. Um, it was built by two English brothers that never visited the shores of Australia. Um, it was all done via telegram and letter um, and a bunch of people that they managed to employ in Sydney to come out and build it. This here was the administration building that the Great Cobar Mine built to administer the mining and pay all of the miners and then hold the copper before it went out on the train line, which is on this line across here. Um, the, the, the brief was originally to look at um, a master plan for the whole site. Um, first of all, actually, we'll start again. Yes, the brief, the brief originally was to help them talk about how to, to look after the roof because it was leaking and they'd got a small grant to help uh, fix that up. What we then started talking to them about was um, mining isn't usually our gig. It's not something that we can hand on heart, say that we support and that we need to look forward. And can we have a, a larger, um, wider ranging discussion about how this museum might talk about the history, but might also talk about where we're going in the future, um, which were they were very uh, open to. That but it's a great museum, like quirky local museum. Yeah, like it's got lots of weirdness. weird things <laughs> in it. Um, but the, the important part was that we, we started a discussion around how we might remediate or ameliorate this very damaged site and have that as part of the visitor experience of coming to Cobar. Um, they've got a huge collection of amazing old photographs of the old mine, which you can see on the left here. And we started talking to them about um, favourite museums that we've been to, which uh, may be a little grandiose when we're talking about Cobar, but have their similarities. We've got on the left-hand side, Kettles Yard in Cambridge, and on the right, the, the Soane Museum. So um, buildings that were built originally as for something else and became museums and galleries, and then just got stacked full of things that people collected. Um, the project then led to uh, this idea of the larger master plan, taking people out into the landscape and how we can repair that, start telling the stories of the traditional owners through landscape and planting, and also talking about remediating damaged sites through planting, which then brings up the discussion of what, what is the future of mining. Uh, the, the project then 
gained a bit more traction when we were able, the, the council were able to secure more money. Um, and so it's moved on now to a, a, a larger renovation of the existing building uh, to, to house the collection. We're working with a, a museum's advisor from Create New South Wales to, uh, to work with the local curator um, and also to work on the, the more fine landscape in the contained area within the fence line. So a lot of this early work was done to start being able to break the project up into small bite-sized pieces, which can then go out and get funded. And images like this, um, which incidentally, this bridge is the bridge that was removed um, from um, Safala. And it's at, when you drive into Safala, which is obviously nowhere near Kobar, um, we took a photograph of this bridge. It's on the side of the road as you drive into the town. But then we were talking about how we might be able to design a gantry across the old mine site, which is now filled up with groundwater, to be able to look down into it. And we, and we were using the language of the, of the of early 20th century mining, which happened to fit with this bridge. So it was photoshopped in. Um, other areas looking at remedial work and storytelling opportunities within the site. Um, and then the next one, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, taking, there's so many mining artifacts around the place that we thought we could incorporate the actual artifact with, with some of the large uh, photographs of the existing mine over the existing footprints of where those structures were Jeez. originally located. These these things are not photoshopped in. They this is what the site looks like. There's stuff like this just lying around. They're the everywhere. tumblers. So what they did is they they dig a big hole originally with you know by hand and using horse drawn carts to drag it all out of the ground. They would then put all of the rock into these tumblers, which were steam powered. So there was a huge chimney stack in the middle of the site that was made from cast iron. They tumble the rock to separate the ore and then heat it to get it to a relatively pure state into ingots and then ship it out to Sydney. Um, so a, a hugely destructive process. Um, but now with the entropy that's happened over the last hundred years, the site's actually starting to come alive. And it's one of the only places with a standing body of water for hundreds of kilometers. Um, and this is, we're actually just about to start constructing the access ramp that we can see in this montage. Um, and we're currently documenting all of the, the work that's happening in and around the building to improve and, and make this a, 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 a better local museum. The idea being at the moment people stop for an afternoon when going through Cobra on their way to Burke. What we talk to local councils and local governments about when we work on these regional projects is not increasing the numbers of people that visit the town, but to increase the length of their stay. So if you can provide one core area that can attract attention for three to four hours, um, it's likely then that other local businesses and tourism experiences will develop around that to encourage people to spend a night, which means people are eating and, and sleeping in the town. And that can more than triple uh, the spend per visit. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Is that the last one? This yeah. might be the last one. That was yeah. the, oh, the end for now. That, this was a, um, a relocation of an underground mine experience at the moment that's tacked onto the side of the building. We suggested that it was damaging the building and was, in fact, pretty dangerous. And what we needed to do is put it back out in the landscape. So I think that's the final, yeah. the final image. That's it. <laughs> so what did you do? <laughs> now we we turn this off now, don't we?
Well, that, that has had an ongoing impact because now if you want to put the verandas back, you have to make them structurally so that the collar, the posts are, are, are not important, so that your drunk mayor can still back into the post and the veranda won't fall on his car. We, so, we were told an anecdote about this, and I can't vouch for its truth, but it's a really good story, that in when the Queen visited Wagga, Wagga, Wagga Wagga Council at the time very busily removed most of their verandas, and when the Queen turned up, she was stood outside um, being battered by the elements and made a comment under her breath of it would be nice to have some shade. Um, so I the work that they'd done, they realised that maybe... <laughs> maybe they shouldn't have. Maybe they shouldn't have. So, so the connection to these places, I mean, obviously, Lee, you grew up in... Yeah, so I grew up on South a farm Wales. near Juni, and Juni is one of those towns that actually never had enough money to get rid of their verandas. So it's... Um, pretty much intact because it's always been too poor to modernise, which is um, it's now its, um, its greatest asset. So It's quite fantastic that, that, that is a position, isn't it? Then you've yeah. These beautiful yeah. towns are that beautiful because they didn't have money to modernise the period of time when yeah. no one else had money. It's great. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's the classic kind of neighbouring town, which was always where the, where the richer people lived, and it now is just, like, looks terrible in comparison. But... Um, so, and I think there's something about, like, there's no, I, I really, I'm, I don't believe at all in the whole country-city divide that people talk about in, in, in Australia sometimes, I don't, and, and both sides talk about it, let me tell you. But um, there is something that's really nice about going to places and doing work for people who really aren't used to getting um, the attention. They aren't used to getting the um, people paying um, that much, giving that much thought to their their town and their their buildings. It's just um, nice to work in that kind of environment. And, I mean, the other, the one thing that is very, very different is that they have all these big buildings, these massive buildings and big sheds, and, and when you go out there from the city, you think, oh, imagine the party you could have in this, and they just straight away look at you and go, yeah, but who would you invite? Like, there's no one to really come to that party. And, and in any case, everyone's got a shed this big. So um, it's nothing. I think the, the important thing to though to, about all of these projects that we've shown is that there are a group of really dedicated locals behind all of them. Yeah. And so a lot of those are working for local government um, and they drive the project along. Mm. And without, without that um, level of engagement, these projects couldn't happen and we're lucky when we get to be involved. A lot of them are won through open tenders, um, which we all know the, the pain of, of winning those jobs, but um, some of them happen as a result of existing relationships and work um, that, you, that you have done and how mm. we get on, on with it. Mm. Uh, and what seems to work uh, with the stuff that we do is that you go out, you know, these local councils, they don't they don't have someone in house who can do a good grant application. They don't have project managers. They don't have, they just don't have the resources. So um, we go out there and we just find out what they need help with. And so that's how we've sort of become quite multi skilled because they were like, oh, well, there's this grant and we'd really like to go for it, but we don't know how to do the grant application. We're like, well, we can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. It's really, I mean, I think. Um I often notice in small country towns that the these the kind of projects you're talking about are the kind of projects that happen once in a generation. Like there's not there's not there's not massive amounts of money to go into country towns. So it's it's so super important that when we do do them, that they have the level of commitment that you guys I think show in these projects. It's just so fantastic. And I'm, I want to say again because my apparently my mic was muted when I was talking to you earlier, but I just wanted to say. Thank you for the talk. It was really absolutely gorgeous and beautiful and really lovely to see the, the kind of investment you're making into the process and the quality of the work is really just fantastic. And as I said, the, the, uh, maybe it's the romanticism in me, but just looking at the photographs you had of rural, rural Australia at this point in time, I'm just gagging to get back out. So Feeling homesick. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling homesick. But yeah. thank you. I mean, we really appreciate it. Um, one of the things I wanted to just touch on tonight was obviously, as well as 
all of the practitioners and everyone around Sydney are being isolated during the, co the COVID. We've got also all the students in the country who are um, isolated away from the universities. Indeed, some of them are, are still in, uh, isolated internationally. And so lots of these talks we've been hearing are fulfilling some of um, their voids in terms of the normal um, opportunities for them to go to public lectures with um, architects coming to visit. So thank you for your time. We really do appreciate it. We have another talk this week, Andrew Burns, which is pretty exciting. Um, that's yes, uh, great. And, yeah, that'll be really fantastic to see Andrew Burns' talk come, come up. So Andrew's going to be on on Thursday night. You can get everyone can... Um, um, everyone can register via Eventbrite. The only reason I use Eventbrite is because it just makes it very easy for me to send you an all an email while I'm also trying to run a practice at the same time. So thank you for everybody. But I do post it in the Instagram um, post at the top in our website address if everyone misses it. Um, so yeah, we've got Andrew this week and then next week we've got Philip Vivian from Batesmart talking about some speculations the office has made about uh, urban speculations for the city. And we have Jeremy McLeod from Breathe Architecture and famously, um, Nightingale is going to talk to us as well. We've got a whole. Lot, I think I've got enough lineup for about the next six months of architects. But we'll just see. We'll see how long the isolation goes. <laughs> to see how long these go for. See how much my um, my, uh, my, my I can keep up with it. But um, yeah, thanks. Thanks to the two of you. We really appreciate it. It was really great um, to have you here. Um, thanks to everyone for watching. Really in, enjoy having you here. Uh, and yeah. We'll see you all again on Thursday night. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, for organising it. We're all appreciating it. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Pleasure, pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. See you, everyone. See ya. Bye. See ya.